Hi, good evening. Um, sorry I can't be with you. Uh, my car decided to break down this morning um, on the way here. So I should have been with you in person. So we've hastily prepared and tested the tech and hopefully this will work tonight. So uh, yeah, my name's Adrian Greenslade. I work for Intexo. Um, my business partner is with you tonight, uh, Lucas. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, in, in text, though, is uh, all about um, products that will help and the, for the betterment of the environment and to inform the public about environmental issues. Um, uh, my interest in air quality started quite a few years ago because I was directly affected by uh, my father um, uh, became ill with COPD. Um, and unfortunately died um, and I've always been interested to find out why because he was a very fit and healthy person up to a point and then he was suddenly affected by it and wanted to know whether it was you know environmental whether it was occupational and what it was we still don't know um, but I'm quite passionate and, and look at these things on a uh, as an engineer because I am a, an engineer so I look at them from that sort of perspective um, so what I want to do today is I'm going to share my screen. I've got a little presentation for you um, regarding air quality. So let's see if this works. Let's go to share screen. And I think we're on that one. And hopefully you can see my screen. Is that okay? Can you see that on the screen now? Yes. Yeah, you can. Okay. So you know, I will be turning to the left because my screen is on here. I do apologize. I'm not facing you all the time. Um, so yeah, today we'll be investigating the issues of air pollution. Um, and if I can get it to move on, which it doesn't seem to be wanting to do. Here we go. Technical issues straight away. Okay, um, so what do you know about air? You know, it, we, we think about the air very little. Um, it's there, it's always around us. It's a commodity that we don't think a lot about. Um, but without it, we're completely scuppered. You know, we, we can't live without it. Um, but a lot of people turn around and say, as free as the air, you know, is the air free? You know. It's clean. I'm going outside with some fresh air. Is it fresh? The sayings that we say, but we don't actually think about it in any depth. So the Encyclopedia Britannica's definition is it's a mix of it's a mixture of gases comprising the Earth's atmosphere. As simple as that, a mixture of gases. But you know, there's lots of things within the air, and the good things, and I think you'll probably remember this from school, or possibly remember this from school is that it's you know, made up mainly of nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% of other things like argon, carbon dioxide. And they're good, you know, that's how it should be. When it is pure and it's good, yeah, it's invisible, it's tasteless, it's odorless. Yeah? You, you don't know it's there. Oh, here we go. So, so, why can we sometimes see and smell it? And that's because there are lots of impurities and other things within the air um, that get into it, such as nitrogen dioxide from car exhausts, carbon monoxide, um, and fine particulate matters, you know, small, small things, um, and ultra fine particulate matters that are, have been proven to be really, really bad for us. You know, things that are smaller than, um, uh, 2.5 micron. So contributors to air pollution are, uh, and we know, everybody knows a lot of these at the moment, is, you know, emissions from industrial plants, manufacturing activities, construction sites, things like that, any burning of, or combustion of fossil fuels, so car exhausts, um, gas fires, uh, power stations, um, but also, you know, farming chemicals and household products. 
um, not just the manufacture of these, but the actual use of them. Um, and there are also you know, natural causes. Uh, we have you know, forest fires and volcanic eruptions. You know, particularly forest fires have caused quite a lot of air pollution um, recently. They say it brought about by the, um, you know, the global warming. There's going to be more of them. Um, and waste incineration. You know, if we, we burn things that we've created, we are not just, when creating them, making air pollution, but we're then burning them as well afterwards and creating even more air pollution. Our bodies do try to protect us. You know, naturally our bodies, we have mucous membranes, we cough, we sneeze, our eyes run. We know that the air quality can be bad. You know, when it is bad, and it gets to a level we all know about it yeah and the body has tried to develop but what it can't get rid of is the very very fine particles it doesn't know that it's even being breathed in so what are these fine particles now i've tried to demonstrate here on the screen yeah the um a pm 2.5 uh, is 40 times smaller than a grain of sand now that's really difficult to visualize. So I've tried to do it with a little diagram here on the, on the right hand side. If you imagine that the orange is a grain of sand at 90 microns, yeah, and the width of the human hair is the pink, yeah, the darker blue is the PM10 particle, but the ultra fine particle, the one that gets through the bloodstream, through the lungs, and goes into every part of the body, is that tiny, tiny light blue dot there, um, PM2.5. Now, me being me, I did a little calculation yesterday um, that if that was a real grain of sand and was perfectly spherical, you'd get 355,000 of those ultra prime particulate matters within that grain of sand. Yeah. And that's what gets in through into your bloodstream. So what are the effects of these air pollutions on human health? So the fine particular matters, the 2.5, it can penetrate through the lungs and further enter the body through the bloodstream. It affects all major organs. Exposure to 2.5 can cause diseases both to our cardiovascular system and respiratory system, provoking, for example, stroke, lung cancer, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, which is what my father died of. There's also new research out there at the moment that is saying that you don't even have to have been born for this to be, protect, uh, to be affecting you. you know? uh, Prenatal exposure to high levels of air pollution will cause developmental delay at age three within children, as well as psychological and behavioral problems later on. Um, you know, attention deficit, hyper disorder, you know, hyperactivity disorder, anxiety and depression. So it's affecting us even before we are born. So what do the government say about this? Now, the government produced a report um, through Public Health England um, about air quality. And it's a big, long report. If you look on the government.gov website, it is there and you can read through it all. But the summary and the very first paragraph of that is this, poor air quality, is the largest environmental risk to public health in the UK, as a long-term exposure to air pollution can cause chronic conditions such as cardiovascular, respiratory diseases, as well as lung cancer, leading to reduced life expectancy. Yeah, that is their leading paragraph to the report. So what is the scale of the problem? Let's try and you know, investigate what is happening out there. So the estimation is, you know, 28 to 36,000 deaths in the UK yeah, through long-term exposure to you know, man-made air pollution. That's a huge amount. You know, it, it, it's, it's more, um, more than double the deaths of coronavirus in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland combined over the two-year period. Yeah. And, and, you know, air pollutants are emitted from a range of both man-made and natural sources, you know, everyday activities, transport, industrial process, farming. Yeah. All these things have a detrimental effect on the air quality. But what they say is if we could reduce that by just one microgram per meter cubed, yeah, 
over the following 18 years, we would save nearly 51,000 cases of coronary heart disease, 16,500 strokes, lots of asthma and lots of lung cancers. Yeah, is what they, what they believe the science. So, okay, we said earlier that free is the air. Yeah, is it really free now? You know, there was a, a parliamentary um, uh, report put together, which was made up from DEFRA, Department of Health and Department of Transport, to what the actual cost was in real terms in money. Yeah. And 2007, they came out and they estimated that it was between 8.5 billion and 20.2 billion a year in 2005 was the cost. It was somewhere in between that, but even the lower end of scale, 8.5 billion is a huge amount of money. Yeah. Um, and that's again, a parliamentary committee that did that report. Some facts, yeah. The Air Quality Management Resource Centre note that the health impacts of air quality in the UK almost twice those of physical inactivity. So if you're a couch potato, yeah, and you don't do very much exercise, um, you know, the cost is around the same, uh, twice that at 10.7 yeah, billion per annum. Yet air quality doesn't get any or very little media co coverage. We all know the couch to 5K, we all know the, the drive by the NHS and the government to get us off our backsides and running so that we are healthier. Um, and they spend a lot of time and money and effort on that. However, the air quality, you know, it costs twice as much to the NHS. Um, and again, you know, uh, uh, alcohol abuse, you know, 12 to 18 billion per annum. And it's, it's estimated to be on the same level as that, the health effects. So, and worst of all, yeah, the most sensitive to air pollution are children under 14 years of age. And the reason that is, is they've got a lower body um, weight and size compared to the amount of air that they consume. So they're consuming a vast more amounts because they run around a lot more than us. Um, and they are over 65 who, you know, they have already um, have decreased lung and, and, and function at that age. Um, so they're the ones that are most affected by it. So how do we measure it in the UK? Now, there's, there's several ways to do it. One of the, the main systems out there is the ORM, which is the Automatic Urban and Rural Network. And what that is, is and you'll see them on, on some of the highways and uh, around the country. Um, they're big units that sample the air at 2.5 to 3 metres in height and pull that air in. Um, they sample it, they take the data and they measure it um, against the, uh, the ambient air quality directives. Yeah. Yesterday I looked on the, uh, the DEFRA website to see you know, how many are actually working in the UK. And there there's, was about 10 to 15 that weren't working. They were broken down. So there was 170 working yesterday. Yeah, which, you know, 170 sounds quite a lot. They are expensive. They are big bits and very scientific bits of kit. However, what that actually means is there was one per 550 square miles yesterday. Yeah. Now, that can't drag in 550 square miles worth of air to sample, yet the data is extrapolated out and they take it and they model it and using some small low cost sensors, they come up with, um, as you can see here, a daily map of what the air quality is perceived to be. And you can see there that it looks like, you know, it's really good. We're all green. There's some ones and twos and threes, but I'll explain what they mean later because um, they're level of pollution, but they're all green. Um, incidentally, the closest on to Colville is in Leicester, either on the university or on the A594 roadside. So it's 10 miles away, yeah, as the crow flies from you. Um, just made the map a bit bigger there. You can see that there's two very close together in Leicester. Not quite sure why they are so close together. 
Um, and then we have a, a big expanse of nothing um, from, you know, Market Bosworth, Meesham, Swaddon Coat, right up to Castle Donington, the airport, all along the M1. There's nothing uh, measured there um, from the Orn. There may be lower cost sensors that the councils have that do feed the data in, but they're not available to be seen on here. Yeah. Uh, and, and interestingly, this is the description from the DEFRA website of the, which I, I you know, it made me smile um, of where the Orn site is. Uh, so it's, it's within an existing brick building located within the grounds of Leicester University campus. The nearest road is Welford Road, which is a busy road, yeah, but it's 20 metres to the west. And the surrounding area is mainly open and comprises a park, a university building, a cemetery and a parking lot. Now, I thought to myself, what relevance does that have to Colville if that's where they're measuring it? Because one, it's a parking lot. The cars are parked. They've not got their engines running. Yeah? They're not driving through it. They will arrive, they'll turn their engine off and the car will stay there inactive until the time that they come back to it to move it. It's a cemetery. You're not really gonna have a lot of, um, shall we say activity going on there. Um, you know, you will have people visiting, but there's not going to be a huge amount of people causing a lot of um, particular matter or that type of nature. So it, it did, I did sort of question why they would put it there. So DEFRA, um, which is the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, are in charge of and produce the reports um, that come out on a daily basis. And what they've done, which is very good, is they have color coded the amount of pollution and given every single different type that they want to monitor, uh, be it nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, or the PM particles, a value of what is you know, perceived to be low risk to your health, moderate, a high risk or a very high risk. And they've colour coordinated them. And these are available on the, the DEFRA web, websites. Um, an interesting thing to point out there that I don't know if you've noticed, but the, uh, they're based on daily mean concentrations. So what that means is they've set that these are the levels of pollution that are harmful or not harmful to you. Um, but they're measuring them over a 24 hour running mean for the current day. So it doesn't take into account, or it, it does take into account the peaks, but they level it out. Now, I know that, you know, there are peaks times when there are air pollution, and they happen to be the peak times when people are about, because people will cause them with the cars. So when the school run in the morning, the dropping off of the kids, and the picking up of the kids, the working day, when the factories are on and working, there are high peaks of air pollution. Um, but that is counteracted by the 24 hour period of when there is no cars on the road, the, uh, the factories are shut down, you know, and the level drops. So they take a mean level of that. So what we can see there is that the peaks are not being reported. I've watched the DEFRA website map to see what it does over probably the last year. And very, very rarely do you see an amber or anything but green on there. No, it always says it's green and it's like, and it will be to the guidelines because it's taken over a mean period. However, there will be pe peaks and people will be breathing in poor air. Otherwise, why would it be the, uh, what did they say? The, the most uh, concerning environmental factor. So what does the scale mean? Yeah. So the air pollution banding of low, what, what they say is there is a, an accompanying health message for at-risk individuals. And there's an accompanying message for the general population. So green means enjoy your outdoor activities. You know, there's no concern whatsoever. And from my observations, you know, what I've seen every time I've looked at it this year, it's been green. So it would say that we have an absolutely, you know, uh, great air quality within the UK. 
Um, if it's moderate, adults and children with lung problems and adults with heart problems who experience symptoms should consider reducing strenuous physical activity, particularly outdoors. They don't want you running around breathing lots of nasties in and possibly causing yourself um, issues. Uh, if you're healthy, it says enjoy your usual outdoor activities. At the higher end of the, the levels, you know, it, it turns around and says people with lung problems and heart problems should reduce strenuous physical exertion outdoors. And particularly if they experience symptoms, people with asthma may find they need to use the relief inhaler more often. But even the people that have no problem may experience discomfort for such as sore eyes, cough, sore throat, and they should consider reducing activity outdoors. And if it gets to very high, you know, you can see there that adults and children with lung problems, you know, it says it should avoid any strenuous physical activity and they need to use the really inhaler more often. Um, and even for the general public, it says reduce physical exertion, particularly outdoors, uh, especially if you, you, you're observing symptoms. So who sets these limits then? Now, the government set the limits and they set them from the World Health Organization's uh, guidelines back in sort of 2006, um, roughly to them. Yeah. Since then, uh, the World Health Organization has published much, much stricter limits. There's a lot more um, study has gone into it and much more um, science into what happens um, and what the, the uh, consequences of these um, particular matters are. And the WHO recommend to cut by 50% the guidelines for a fine particulate matter for the 2.5s. They're halving the levels that they say is, is you can still be considered to be good. And it's slashed, you know, the nitrogen dioxide from the car engines by 75%. Now, in comparison, the legal limits in the UK are very disturbingly high because we're still working on the 2006 levels. Yeah. So the government, even though they're averaging out the levels that they say are good for you, it's still set much, much higher than what the World Health Organization says they should be. So what do we learn then? The pollutants are all around us. Air quality is measured to a scale that's higher than who recommends. Air quality is measured not locally, but extrapolated from sensors a great distance from your location. The data is averaged out across the day and doesn't report peaks, enabling it to stay within the government set guidelines. The data is not readily available unless you go searching for it. You can go onto the DEFRA site and you can see the map, um, but to get to the data behind that, you either have to download data sets and trawl through it yourself and look at it and it's geeks like me that do that sort of thing um not the general public it's you know it's not there at your fingertips it's not telling you what it is what you're breathing now um 30 000 deaths proportion to poor air quality every year you know it, it's been proven that is it and it's costing up to 20 billion a year yeah, in money um, it affects you before you're born and it can get into every organ in your body through your bloodstream. And it's a major factor in diseases such as asthma, heart disease, stroke, COPD. And unfortunately, the most affected by these are those under 14 and over 65. So, you know, there, there is big issues out there that I don't feel is being um, told to the general public. So what can we do? And this is, you know, I, I want to protect the children. Um, you know, they they don't understand it. They're too young. They, they, they don't even think about it. So we need to protect it. And this is what the WHO says we should do about it. So we should stop burning household and agricultural waste. Yeah. And we should reduce children's exposure to air pollution caused by vehicle exhausts. You know, avoid busy roads. Carry a baby, young child, yeah, so they're not the same height as exhausted emissions. We put children in um, push chairs and we push them along the side of the road, right at the level of the exhausted emissions. 
and we don't think about it. Interestingly, you know, the another way that they measure air quality is they don't measure it at that height. They actually measure it between 2.5 and 3 meters up, yeah, which it's already dissipated quite a lot where they measure it, the distance in height. So it's not actually measured where you breathe it, it's measured above where you're breathing, which again, I feel is not right. Um, and it says, you know, monitor air pollution levels locally. So have local levels and inform people about it. You know, not have all systems 10 miles away that they're extrapolating the data to say what the air quality is where you are, because it's very localized. You know, if you have a bonfire nearby, you know, in, in Colville and it's putting lots of fumes out um, that's bad for your health, the Orne system in Leicester is not going to pick that up, but it's going to affect and damage the children and people locally to that fire that's going on. You know, raise awareness in your community about the health impacts of air pollution and work with healthcare providers, community leaders, relevant authorities to promote policies that reduce air pollution and protect your child's health. But not just the children, this goes for everybody as well. You know, but this is what who say about the children. So where do we come into that? Um, that's all about it. Now comes to the point where I tell you what we're doing. You know, we have um, helped create uh, an eco post. Now, what we're trying to do with the eco post, um, you can see in the background here, and there's, a, there's a couple um, within uh, Coville Can at the moment on display is what it is doing it is sampling the air constantly and it will change color dependent on the air quality. Now, instead of averaging that out and sitting there green, what it does is it picks up on the peaks that are occurring. And as the peak occurs, it will change the relevant color. So it will change from green to the ambers, to the reds, to the purples. So at a glance, you can turn around and know what the air quality is like where you are. And we're trying to promote this and get people to, to um, take this on. We have tested this. Um, we have uh, worked with the Senior Scientific Officer of Newport, um, where an eco post was hoisted in the air so that it was playing fair against the Orn system. And it was put next to the Orn system and measured for three months the air quality, and the readings were almost identical. You know, our system costs you know, a few thousand pounds. The Orn system costs hundreds of thousands of pounds to run. Yeah, and we were getting very, very similar results. So, so close, in fact, that um, the, the senior scientific officer from Newport, and um, only today. Uh, wants to install two of our eco posts in Newport. So, um, so we think they're ideal for school and public spaces, you know, anti-idling campaigns. I'd love to see one of these outside every single school so that the parents, when they're driving in their cars, don't sit outside and idle their car. So they take responsibility to keep it green. Yeah. And that's one of the slogans we're responsible to keep it green. Um, and I am a, a car window knocker. I'm afraid when I take my kids to school, I will walk up and knock on the window and say, would you mind, you know, turn your engine off? Um, because unfortunately, that's where the school kids walk in. They're that height. They're breathing that pollution straight in. We want to prevent that. And so town centres, busy roads, industrial areas, construction sites. You know, um, whenever there's a construction site or building strike, they put up lots and lots of um, you know, silica dust into the air and it can cause you know, problems for people walking around and, and breathing that in. You know, you'll, you'll have noticed busy construction sites that not only will you see the dust, but they're actually trying to manage it by wetting it down and, and hosing down all the, the, uh, the air pollution and by making a, a, a water curtain um, to try and stop it coming out because it's bad for you. You know, we have an app that comes with it that you can set to your local eco post and you can turn around and get alerts from it that tell you whether it is low, moderate, 
high or very high. It'll alert you what the level is and give you some, um, you know, some advice on, on what uh, you should be doing. It monitors and reports to the national guidelines. However, we can set the eco post swab to also monitor at the who recommended guidelines. It can do both. And it's very interesting when you, you sit them next to each other because the, the UK guidelines will stay green and the WHO will move up to Amber's um, and, and warnings. Yeah, so it, it, it's an it's a interesting um, comparison that can be done. It also, you've got lots and lots of data that comes with the app and the website. You know, you can get that historical data. You can see the trends. You can see when the peaks are and you can see on the map, you know, the 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 perceived areas you know the map on the right here does show um poland um because there are a lot of eco posts that have been installed within poland at the moment so you know that is you know what i wanted to come talk to you today about um you know the acknowledgements that i want to say and the material sources i've found today are all of this is from these people yeah, from Global Action Plan to the government themselves. You know, they're readily, this, this is available, you've got to dig for it and you've got to have an interest to find it. Um, but it is all there. So, yeah. what do you now know about air? And what will you do about it? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time and listening. Any questions? I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll come back to the, uh... there you go. So, do we have any questions? I've got a question. This morning we had Ashby Council come and they asked about maintaining the eco posts and what that involves. Yeah, well, the, the eco posts, you know, they, they all have sensors in them and, and what we, will do as part and parcel of uh, selling them is we will come and we will maintain that sensor and calibrate it on a yearly basis to make sure it's tip top condition. Um, you know, we can go, we can come and we can do it in situ on site, but what we actually do is we, we bring a brand new calibrated, you know, sensor and we swap it out. We put a new one and we do the recalibration and the cleaning and everything else of it back at the factory. So that's part and parcel of, of you know, the, the maintenance that comes with the eco post. It's, it's the measurements, you know, there's several different ways of measuring, but the, the particular matter is done by laser diffraction, just for anybody that was interested. Anything else? I'm struggling to hear. I think whoever's maybe asking a question is to the side of the microphone, so I can't hear it. I, I think you're going to have to come to the front of the, uh, <laughs> the the laptop. I can't hear you from the side. Hi. <laughs> um, Hello. Okay. Hi. Does it measure the ultrafine particulate matter as well as the larger? And how does it differentiate on the like signals that you get? Yep. So it, yes, it does. It, it measures, um, the, the EcoPost actually measures um, PM10, PM2.5 and PM1. So it gets even smaller. Uh, and again, like I said, it's done by laser diffraction and it, it, it sees the particle and it works out how many it is. You know, the, the, the science behind it now, you know, these small form factor laser counters have proved to be very accurate. Um, uh, and very cost effective compared to the bigger one systems. Yeah, um, a practical question, but how wide a sample does it take when it's measured? Yeah, is it sort of five meters around it or 20 meters around it? Or does it go? Wait, I mean, that, that, that's all, yeah, it obviously measures the locality around it. It's difficult to say exactly how far that covers because lots of things affect that like you know is there wind flow coming through from the wrong direction you know is it in a still environment um but it, it pulls in a set amount of air yeah 
and it counts the particles in that set amount of air um, and, and, and works that. So, yeah, is, is it going to measure exactly the same here as it does 20 meters over there? Possibly, but maybe not if it's closer to a bonfire or, a, you know, or, or something emitting if it's next to a car exhaust then it will, it, it will record higher. But with the low cost sensors, you know, it's much better in my mind to have one locally than it to be measured 10 miles away and you being modeled and they think that's what you're gonna get because they don't know what building work's going on, what industrial you've got, you know, in, in, industrial things are going on, be it quarry, be it, you know, whatever. Um, this gives you a much closer, more um, pinpointed than something 10 miles away. Sorry, you're going to have to come in front. It, the microphone just doesn't, doesn't pick up unless you're right in front of it. Basically, inside the uh, inside the sensor, there's a fan plugging in the air in, going through the sensor. We get the Targeted that sounds like it's Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he'd gone. I couldn't see him. <laughs> Can I ask what services it needs for installation? Um, you, you know, the, the Eco Post can run on mains power. Um, Lucas and I are actually working on and, and are able to produce a solar version now. So you can actually have a solar panel to run it on. Um, it can work on a local uh, Wi-Fi network or you can put a, a, a SIM inside it, a SIM card, and it can run and, and send the data off using that. So there's, there's lots of options for you. Um, the one that I've got here is actually working on a battery. So, yeah. Thank you. Is Lucas talking again? <laughs> <laughs> And you see people looking across that way, but I can't. Oh, I, I think the presentation covered that much. We've now run out of questions. Hey, <laughs> I, hope you enjoy, I hope you enjoyed it. And, and it, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm a, a very, very keen enthusiast on everything air quality. And, and as you could probably tell, I geek out a little bit on it. Um, so, yeah. Thank you very much, Adrian. We'll uh, record it and make it into a video so we can upload it and thank you we just share it with people you don't have to <laughs> you don't have to go around places anymore <laughs> i i enjoy going around places i i enjoy the meeting and, and, uh, you know talking to people it's it's great it's just unfortunate i can't be there today <laughs> <laughs>